So we have Tyson from Drake Meets. Uh, this is episode 13 of the new meta. Welcome, Tyson. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Um, so usually we kick this off with you telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, and uh, yeah, just any any anecdotes about life are always welcome. Awesome. No, sounds good. Yeah, so my name is Tyson Ediger. I am from small town Sask, uh, Drake, Saskatchewan, and uh, grew up there, ended up moving out to BC uh, pretty much right after high school to uh, Trinity Western. Some people have probably heard of that or gone there. And uh, after that, I, I went back to work for my family's company, which is called Drake Meats. So um, still located back in, back in Drake Sask, the small village of 200 people now, I think. Growing up, it was probably closer to 300 and it's been cut in, in a third now. Uh, yeah, very, very small, but um, the business is still thriving there. I, uh, I still work remotely from BC, but uh, over the past three years, I guess, I've been, I've been working much more um, uh, closely with them in a, in a marketing role. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Excellent. And, uh, you know, obviously we've, uh, we've worked together for the past couple of months, but uh, on a few projects, but on the side of the business that we haven't uh, been helping you much on, um, obviously, you know, 2020 being the year of COVID, um, you know, how, how did that affect the business? Yeah, on, on the Drake, on the Drake side of things, Drake meat side of things, we were, we were extremely fortunate throughout COVID in that we were, you know, we were deemed a, an essential business. And so our operations weren't affected all that much other than, you know, all the, all the zoom calls that we had instead of in-person meetings, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but if anything, you know, for us, we actually saw an increase in demand and that was mainly due to people being forced to stay inside. Um, so a lot of people were eating at home more. Um, and so, you know, we, we were extremely fortunate in that sense in that we've, we've actually kind of been able to ramp up throughout this, throughout this process. And that kind of leads into uh, the jerky in a box brand actually, um, because it was something that we'd been working on for probably close to three years. And when COVID hit and we kind of kept getting stay at home order after stay at home order, it kind of motivated us to let's get this thing launched because there's probably not going to be a better time to get into e-commerce, right? So um, just to give a bit of background on that, I just so everybody knows. So Jerky in a Box is a direct-to-consumer jerky subscription box um, plus gift box store. And so that was that was something completely new for Drake Meats. We're, we're definitely more of a traditional uh, group of, of people and a traditional company in that we, you know, we sell mostly just to, to large grocery stores and that's how our entire business is set up. So selling directly to consumers online, um, is a very, very different ball game. And it was something that we, we had to learn, you know, over the past, uh, it's been about, what is it? Five months now, four months since we launched. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like that's, you know, you, you guys didn't have the need that maybe other businesses had to do the online launch and like a direct to consumer model. Like, like you said, you were very fortunate and then demand actually spiked on your core services and your core products. Um, so, but you know, this kind of, you saw a window of opportunity where people were buying things online more, like you were saying before people stopped going to restaurants as much, maybe, especially mm -hmm. in the initial phase. Um, so people were basically spending more uh, money on food um, from mm -hmm. like the home buying perspective rather than, you know, spending it maybe at like a local restaurant or a pub or what have you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, obviously uh, we can talk a little bit about the campaign in a little bit here, but, um, you know, like what were your expectations kind of going into, you know, the world of, of e-com? Like if, you know, like what were they up front? And then, you know, how, how was your mind changed? Like once we, 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 we both kind of like got into this together, um, mm -hmm. how did your like opinions of e-commerce and direct to consumer evolve um, through yeah. the process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
for us again because because e-commerce is so unfamiliar to us this was really a kind of a test run for us it was almost like you know the the downside of this is very small if it doesn't work out but it could be a huge thing for us and and to help um get you know the drake brand or the jerky in a box brand the company into the next generation you know kind of secure the future mm -hmm. um you know on, on that note that's kind of how the whole thing came about actually was because we were we were coming up on our 70 year anniversary of of drake meets this was a few years back and uh we were just there was a group of us we were just kind of chatting through that and we thought it's kind of it's just pretty cool to be a part of a, a company that's been around that long, you know, in, in whatever role that, that it is, whether small or big, but it's kind of fun to be a part of that, that legacy. And, you know, to kind of do it justice, how do we, how do we get it another 70 years? And so we kind of started, started talking about that and we looked at our customer base. Um, and just as an example of growing up, I would always hear from people, Oh, you know, they would hear that I that I worked at Drake Meats or that it was kind of in, in the family and they'd say, Oh, my my grandma loves Drake Meats, you know, or my grandpa loves Drake Meats, which is awesome. You know, those are kind of, those are our homies, you know. And so we're that that's great. But at the same time, you know, we're obviously we're not gonna be able to sell to them forever. Um, and we want to we want to just kind of start appealing to a younger group. And that yeah. was that was how this whole thing happened. It was like, okay what what products do we make or, or what's something similar to what we're making now that we could do that's going to appeal to a younger group yeah um we immediately it was like okay beef jerky um we looked at the trends happening in the market portable protein is a huge thing that's growing right now people are reaching for meat-based snacks as opposed to chips and you know chocolate and things like that now mm -hmm. um the keto diet has kind of exploded all, we, we kind of looked at all those things and it was like, oh, you know, jerky's, jerky's the perfect kind of product to, to test this out with. Yeah. Um, and then we looked at, okay, if we're going to target that new group, this younger demographic, um, what would be the best way to distribute that now? You know, it might be different than what we're doing now at, at traditional retail. And, you know, sure enough, we, then we started throwing out maybe e-commerce is, is the way to go. Maybe we can do this directly. Uh, cut out the middleman and, and kind of go direct to consumers. So we started down that path and, you know, get, it kind of snowballed from there into, you know what, let's just, let's just give this thing a go and, and give it all we got. And let's see, let's see where it takes us. So that was kind so, of at the so point. So part of it was kind of like yeah. change the narrative. It's like, to your point around, you know, in, in the conversations, it's like, oh, like my grandpa, grandma, and grandpa love it to like me, my mom yeah. and dad and grandpa now it's like now you get like the multiple generation thing going right so i mean like great foresight on that right because it's like yeah you know it's great that you have these um you know these uh, customers that were kind of like they're for their lifers like it's like they love your mm -hmm. you know they love your products and they're dedicated but it's like how do we now appeal to those younger generations progressively and that and you know constantly working on that and to your point you know 70 year old company like that's like that's a feat i mean mm -hmm. you know most yeah. companies don't last that long and I, I actually have the numbers on um how long the average company lasts so interestingly um only about three in ten thousand companies last more than 25 years there you go so, i mean it's, I not, know it's, not a, it's not a big number so yeah. You know, like when you kind of like use that as a reference point, like the longevity of, of the business as it stands today is incredible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I what I love about what you guys have done is you've really taken the what people love about Drake Meats, which is the quality of the product. You've taken that and you've brought it into a new business model, right? And one of the things that e-commerce is commonly known for is you've got a lot of people that are just trying to make a buck, a lot of people that are doing drop shipping, a lot of stuff coming from China, a lot of products out there that are just really subpar. Um, and you guys have really raised the bar on like what the quality is, you know, when you're looking at, at beef jerky um, and in, in this direct to consumer space. And, you know, it, I think that it's often understated. People think that you can just like launch a campaign with no brand and just like a cheap product 
and just like trick people into buying it. But it's like, people are smarter than that. You have to have those things in place to really scale to the next level. Definitely. I think, I think that's a good point, Ricky, like on the product side, that that's really what makes our, what that's what makes jerky in a box quite unique compared to some of the other subscription boxes that you'd find. Um, typically subscription boxes are curated by a brand that doesn't make that product. And that's where we're actually making every single product that goes into our subscription boxes, which is, it's, it's nice because we, we do have control over the quality, right? If we have any issues, we can deal with it directly and, and immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's, that's part of what, what makes it, you know, a little bit unique, but um, you know, back to Nick's, back to Nick's question um, on, on how our view has kind of changed. You know, we, we went into this with kind of with not a lot of expectations. It was like, this could be absolutely huge. Um, we could fall on our fl- on our face here too, um, but let's kind of give it a go. And and that was when we kind of approached Blue Meta to help us really figure out the the promotion side of things. Um, and just a little background on that, like being from Drake, Saskatchewan, um, it's it's a Mennonite community. And I don't know if it's I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but our our whole group, we're not big on promoting ourselves very aggressively. It, it makes us like. Uh, it just makes us all uncomfortable and the Drake brand is the same way. We just don't like, we don't like yeah. doing that a lot. And so it's very, it's very humble. It just leads on product, right? Yeah. We're like, let's let the product speak for itself and hope and hopefully people it's good enough that people will share it. You know, that's, yeah. that's kind of the, it's maybe it's lazy. That's just kind of our, that's just kind of how we've done things. But with the e-commerce, we very quickly learned that that is not going to work right? Like you, you need to hit it pretty hard. And I think that's where Blue Meta has really pushed us too. It's like, hey, you guys need to, you guys need to scale this up uh, uh, quickly. And, you know, you guys have really facilitated that process for us. So, you know, that's, that's one way that my, my, I guess, view of it has changed since. Yeah, I mean, like, to, to kind of get into the campaign of it, um, you know, one interesting thing is that, you um, and to your point, Tyson, is that once you launch, if it goes well, other people watch, right? Yeah. And the second that they see, it's like, oh, like something's happening here. And to Ricky's point about, you know, people always trying to find a niche and jump in on it. Like this is actually the problem that happens. It's like your success generates problems from competitors. Um, but again, like, I think that this is where the advantage that you previously, previously spoke to being that you're you actually make your own product versus mm-hmm. other people are just curating or potentially just getting like you know some sort of like middleman to like drop ship the product um this is the advantage right because it's like the the commitment to quality product the commitment to you know making your customers happy versus making like a quick buck it's all about like that value exchange and you guys are doing some innovative stuff where you're coming out with like your own like flavors there, you mm-hmm. know, there's nothing like them in the market, um, you know, and that like strong commitment to product, which is like historic to, to the brand of like Drake meets like as mm-hmm. a whole, like that's really the advantage that is being pushed. And like, that's kind of the moat that slowly but surely is being created for jerky in a box. Yeah, right? absolutely. So yeah, for sure, you know, like um, Ricky, like maybe like we could, uh, you could kind of give like a high high level of like the campaign like up front and then you know mm-hmm. maybe ask like Tyson like a question or two about you know where you know what was done like you know how, like how did the launch process go and you know like what was the back and forth there because as Tyson said like there wasn't too many expectations at the front end but uh you know after maybe like a couple of weeks things things got interesting yeah yeah I mean you know we actually we started um Tyson, as you'll remember, I mean, we started basically building the foundation, right? Which I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people skip. Um, A lot of people just want to like get straight to the profit. Um, They want to get straight to like, let's, let's do it big. Um, And, and not necessarily realizing like the challenges that come along with that, uh, that come very quickly, especially e-commerce, e-com, you know, you've got, you make a thousand sales. uh, If you've got a, a problem in the system, you might have a thousand people DMing you being like, what's going on, right? And, yeah. and it happens all the time. Um, 
And uh, so it's important to really have that like strong foundation that we laid for the first couple months, you know, with uh, on social, like building out the pages, making sure, you know, the audience knows what's happening. Um, and we actually leveraged the, the Drake brand as well to kind of, you know, create kind of a VIP entrance to the product for all, all the, the fans you guys have, because you've got such a great following, um, you know, with the Drake brand already. Um, and transitioning that into the the jerky in a box brand because it, it's such a unique brand, you know, mm -hmm. a unique voice, um, totally separate from from Drake, right? Um, and um, you know, building that strong foundation, um, and then you know, really putting the foundation in to collect the data, right? Collect the data. Mm -hmm. It's it's so valuable. A lot of people will think that um, you know, when you're spending money and you're not making a sale, it's actually like lost. It's, but what you're actually paying for is the data because yeah. mm -hmm. you leverage that into the next sale, right? So to that actual point, like, you know, because I remember this conversation because the, you know, the ads were getting up and running and, uh, you know, we met together and, and it was one of these conversations where it's like, you know, it's kind of going, but we're not seeing a whole lot of movement on the sales front. And we said, hey, like, um, you know, we're just gathered, we're in the data gathering phase to create like a really high quality, um, you know, like stream of data and we have like this methodology where like once the data hits like a certain level um you know we can really target in on on specific behaviors rather than demographics where we usually start uh but we can go move transition from like basically demographic targeting to behavioral targeting mm -hmm. right and uh, and i remember the conversation was like well how much more budget do we need in order to hit that like inflection point and right. we're like, we, we only think we're like two weeks out if, you know, we increase the budget here, here, and here to generate more, you know, to specific budget to ad spend so we can generate that data. And mm -hmm. you guys were like, okay, well, you guys have a methodology, you know, we'll take it as it goes. We'll take your word for it. Like, let's do it. Um, you know, like, what were your thoughts? Like when even like up to that point and then like, you know, even after that meeting, like, cause I know Ricky and I had the conversation maybe two weeks after when it did inflect upwards. Yeah. Like we're like, these guys like basically took us at our word, but like, I think that they were highly skeptical of what <laughs> was about to happen. Yeah. I, that's probably an accurate, that's probably an accurate statement. Like, I mean, we, we, we partnered with, with you guys because we, we fully believe like, you know, we're, we're kind of experts in, in production, manufacturing, making products. Why, let's let's just focus on that, you know, and let's find some experts in this totally new realm that we're entering to kind of help us on that front. So, you know, in, in that spirit, we, we definitely, we, I wouldn't say we were skeptical. We, we trusted you guys. Um, we were just really relying on your, your experience and your kind of recommendations there. And, you know, we, we just didn't know what to expect in terms of you know what kind of return we would get and and the other thing i'll say is like with drake you know the whole idea of measurable marketing i mean that is not easy to do at retail like we we just it's just not a part of the business really on on that traditional side at a very high level maybe but you really can't get into super specific details unless you buy these extremely expensive reports, you know, Nielsen reports, things like that. Yeah. Um, so this, this whole idea of actually having measurable data, measurable marketing, um, you know, down to the fine details that you guys can get, that is, that's so new to us. Um, and it's, it's been, it's been fun to be a part of that, you know, and it can really help justify, you know, the extra budget, like you guys mentioned, like, Hey, we just need to, we just need to plug away at this, you know, for another couple of weeks here you know, we can, we can make that call much more, much more confidently when we can actually see the numbers on it. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And I mean, and I think that's something that like a lot of people are, are maybe not, you know, um, prepared for is that um, when you're going direct to consumer, it's, you know, as you're gathering that data, like the sales start trickling in and it looks like linear, like it looks like this, like progressive, like, Oh, like I put in a little bit more budget. I get like linear results, they're okay, but it only looks linear because it's actually like a J curve, right? So like you hit this inflection point and all of a sudden like, you know, sales start like doubling and then doubling again. 
Mm -hmm. really quickly and then you're like oh like i need to actually potentially slow down because you know inventory yeah so yeah so you know like it's uh it's a bit of a different world whereas like a retail like you launch and it's like you know sales increases are like you know they you start with an offer sales begin like there's a linear increase but it's never like an exponential increase at any point in mm -hmm. time um unless you're just adding more stores or adding more region but online you know X, you can you can double the sales volume like in 24 hours right, right. from one day to another so um and i think that that's kind of like where we got to it at certain points and i don't know the numbers off the top of my head but i mean i, I know at some point we were you know getting like an average of like a 80 dollar sale for i think like five dollars at one point mm -hmm. right or something along those lines and ricky can correct me if i'm wrong yeah, I think I think the cheapest sale we got was like two fifty, you know, and yeah. when it really scaled up to that that gifting season. Um, and I will say, like for for anyone watching this, you know, this was really um, a pivotal ca pivotal campaign moment around Black Friday and Christmas uh, because we really leveraged the the gift shoppers. Um, mm -hmm. As Tyson mentioned, like you know, the the gifting aspect of the business is there. It's there are subscriptions, but um, really leaning into um, when people are ready to buy, there's certain times of the year, you know, they're just, even if your ad costs go up, which they do because there's more competition, there's just moments when people are just ready to buy. Um, and we, and we were ready for that. A lot of people want to come in, you know, like a week before Christmas or a week before Black Friday and say, man, Black Friday's coming. We didn't plan for this, but let's do it. Like, let's get this done. And it just doesn't go because, mm -hmm. Um, they don't realize that like the companies that are doing this successfully are actually planning like three, four months in advance and they're building those audiences. They're building the email list. They're building the campaigns so that like when the moment is there, they, they go and, and then it takes off. Right. But it, it takes a lot like months of planning in advance and collecting the data and building those audiences. Um, to your point, Nick, in terms of like the, the scaling of it, one of the reasons why it goes so fast is because, you know, like compared to retail where you've got the linear like products on shelf, you know, one person buys it, another person buys it. Okay. You could run a campaign to drive additional sales. Sure. You don't have the variables that you have with e -com where um, if your ad is high performing, the higher performing the ad is uh, the lower your cost per click is. And the, and, and so all of a sudden your sales are getting cheaper and cheaper you know, um, you're getting down to as, like, as you're making more sales, as you're making right? more so sales. It's, so it's like, it's not like the, the more sales you get, the cheaper your ad gets means more sales, it, more sales means cheaper ads. And it kind of like, you know, it's cascades cumulative. into the positive it, feedback loop. Exactly. And then you've also got like the social proof aspect of it. You're running an ad. If you've got good, good uh, response on that ad, you know, likes, shares, et cetera, like that fuels the engagement that fuels other people to want to get in. It's kind of like a mm -hmm. buying frenzy because the, the proof is there. People don't want to buy something where nobody else is interested and they're the right. only one looking, right? So, so one question I did have Tyson was like basically around like operations and scaling and e -com because like mm -hmm. now you've kind of got a taste for like how quickly it can scale. And I think at one point, you know, we were doing, um, I think it was like over, uh, over 8,000 or 9,000 a day, Ricky, you could probably know those numbers better than I do, but yeah. you know, like we, we were kind of going at this, like, Hey, like, you know, if we could sell like a grand or two a day, like that was kind of the expectation mm -hmm. to like get this off the ground. But very quickly, we were kind of at the position where I think we scaled to like, say like a hundred thousand, you know, mm -hmm. within like 45 days or something like uh, along those lines, once it got going. Um, right. Obviously, it leads to like operational challenges, you know, and like, uh, like my, my, I guess my primary question would be, if you had to do this again, like, on the operation side, because like, there's people out there right. that are looking at e commerce, like, hey, like, this is great. I want to totally do this. Like, what would be that advice, like going into it for the first time, knowing what you right. know now, what would you have done? Like, what, right. what would the process, thought process be? from when like you originally went into it versus now, like what is, what is that key thing? Right. Well, let me, let me back up first and just I'll, I'll provide a bit of context so people like kind of understand what we're talking about. Like we went from like, would have been probably on average, like 500 
in a day, $500 to like, I think we peaked out at like 16 grand in a yeah. day. Um, and, and that wasn't just one day, like it, you know, this was, this was the black Friday week and it kind of continued after that. So whatever it, you could, you could figure out what that percentage is. I think it's like 5,000, 6,000% increase pretty much overnight. Um, anytime you're dealing with that kind of, a an increase, that kind of a scale, you're, you're probably going to run into some operational challenges. And so with us, with our team, you know, we had built up quite a bit of stock, um, when we launched the brand, which was a few months prior to that. And, you know, we had a good amount in stock. We were kind of slowly going through it. You know, again, we were still gathering the data. Um, and so, you know, sales were a little bit slower and, and we were kind of working through that. And if you would have asked any of us, you know, prior to Black Friday, if we should run another batch, you know, to kind of build up stock before Black Friday, we would have said, you're, you're crazy. Like we, we have so much here already why would we need any more? Like, let's just kind of get through this, the, these batches here, our, our inventory. And then within like two days of this campaign, we were scrambling to try to figure out how we can get some more jerky in because we were, we were going to run out very quickly. And so that was kind of the biggest challenge for us was just, we did not, we did not have the, the foresight we, we were not expecting the level of sales that we got during that week. It was, I think it was kind of a perfect storm of, or not a storm, you know, it was a good, it was a good problem yeah. to have, but um, it was a combination of, you know, with, with Blue Meta's help, we had been running influencer campaigns. We had been running, you know, uh, Google ads and Facebook ads for a few months already. And I think I, well, actually I actually know for a fact, a lot of people who, saw those influencer campaigns and they, they would save the code, you know, the discount code, they would, they waited until Christmas or black Friday to use those codes as well. And so we kind of got all of the results of all of that, those three months of, you know, marketing, I feel like we kind of got that all within a, you know, a two, three week period. And so, yeah. which was, which was great, but, but you're right. Like, you know, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what we would have done differently. I think with the information we had at the time, we were kind of at, the, we were all at a level that we were comfortable with. And yeah. clearly we, clearly we were, we, you know, we kind of misjudged. Um, and, and we, I think our, our kind of philosophy is it's, it's okay to make mistakes like that. Um, but you just need to learn for next year, you know, don't, don't make the same mistake twice. And so that's kind of where we're at is we're just trying to we're just trying to absorb all of these mistakes, fix them, keep the customers happy. And let's just make sure that we don't, you know, make the yeah. same, same one. I mean, from, from our side, it was pretty simple. Cause I mean, we just slowed down the ad spend and we slowed down like a few things to ramp down the sales levels. Right. To, right. you know, which is like interesting when, you know, it's like, Hey, can you slow down the sales? It's like, yes, yes, we can. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, it, yeah. but you know, it's, it, but it's a fairly real thing, right? Like, um, you know, like back to Ricky, I think Ricky mentioned this earlier, but you know, we, we really did, um, like a fairly thorough job of like building up the base, right. In terms of the audience and like getting those, like even like getting email addresses. Right. And like that build up because like, um, to Rick, uh, like to another point, point of Ricky's like first one being like building the fundamentals and the base, which you guys had the patience to do. Um, mm -hmm. which is great. Cause like not everybody has that kind of patience. Number two, um, also the, the idea of like, you know, black Friday starts, you know, four to six weeks minimum before black Friday actually begins. Right. So like getting all those things like prepped and ready so that it's a successful campaign. What I actually thought was really interesting about the campaign is that even after the special was over for Black Friday, the sales continued around that 16K plus mark for like a couple of weeks after the, the special was completely over and done with, right? Which like to me shows like a couple things. It's like, A, the, the campaign, usually campaigns like for Black Friday, it's like you hit a peak, they go back down and then mm -hmm. you, know, you level off to like this new normal what was interesting was that until we backed off on um, like running maybe ads as aggressively as we were before, because, you know, you guys just said to us, it's like, Hey, mm -hmm. if we keep going at this rate, like we're going to run out. Right. Yeah. So, so basically it's like, 
you know, until we actually backed down the spend, the, the, the sales actually stayed at around Black Friday levels, give or take, like, I think 20%, right? Yeah. So it actually created a brand new normal in terms of the, the volume of sale for the business unit. Yeah. And I think it, it just kind of proved to us that, hey, this is, this is actually something that could be um, quite big for us and could be a core part of our business going forward. You know, I, I mentioned before that this was kind of a test, test for us and, and we, we agreed to see where it goes um, with kind of, you know, minimal expectations. But um, obviously our expectations were blown out of the water, um, particularly around Black Friday and Christmas. And I think it, you know, it just, it just got us even more excited about, about this new venture. So, you know, we're, we're really looking forward to seeing what we can do in, in 2021 as well. Absolutely. So. You know, one thing I, I did want to ask you about was actually your thoughts on the subscription model, because, you know, obviously like mm -hmm. based on the business model before of Drake meets, uh, not jerky in a box, like you know, the idea of like, like a subscription was kind of like a new thing to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, what are your thoughts now, now that it's kind of up and running and we're seeing subscription revenue grow month over month? Like, what are your thoughts on like the subscription model? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's an area that we that we want to focus on a little bit more, like with the, with the Black Friday and the Christmas that was that was largely revolving around gift boxes, just yes. because that was the that was the season. But Part of the part of the reason strategically we wanted to offer gift boxes is it's the perfect way to get the product out there. Like as as a one time gift, there's no commitment or anything like that. It's a great gift. trial, right? Like it's like get the exactly. product in people's hands. Exactly, and so we we kind of see the subscription as almost the second step or the follow up to the gift box purchase. Um, after somebody, you know, again we focus on we focus mostly on the quality of our products. That's where we spend a lot of our time. We're hoping that. A lot, of, you know, a large percentage of these people that receive the gift boxes try that jerky, and they say, "This is this is awesome. I would like to get this again." That's when they'll find the subscription where they can really tailor their box to exactly their, you know, their preferences, and uh, they, you know, they can get a bit of a, a better deal on it. So that's that's kind of where we see the subscription model fitting into fitting into this venture, um, and I think it's just it's extremely important, you know, for anybody doing a subscription box, you, you do need to constantly be innovating and coming out with new, new flavors for that box. You, you, you need to give people a reason to keep coming back. And um, that's, that's kind of another area that we want to spend a lot of our time on uh, in, in 2021 is really nailing that down. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think you've kind of nailed it there because like when it comes down to, you know, anybody subscribing to something, like it's all about the product quality because you enjoy it. You're going to order again. Mm -hmm. You want a repeat order and, you know, and then that variety, like adding mm -hmm. those flavors, like not only just being like a high quality product, but also backed with like that, you know, variety as well, you know? So it's, it's kind of like, to your point, the next step um, mm -hmm. in terms of growing the business. But uh, you know, obviously like there's, there's these, the benefits of only having to acquire the customer once instead of, multiple times yeah. for the same customer and you know it lowers your customer acquisition costs and all these things so you know i it, it generates more profitability for the business unit as well right absolutely absolutely so, um tyson like you know thoughts on um you know it's now 2021 um you know vaccines are kind of getting out there potential light at the end of the tunnel for you know the government saying that the pandemic's over maybe by the, the, you know, last half or I don't know, like last quarter of the year, um, specific question, like, you know, what are your thoughts on what will consumer behavior look like, um, you know, after all of this, like, right. you know, what, will it revert to what it was before, or is it going to be some sort of hybrid between today's behavior versus yesterday's behavior? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, I don't think things are gonna go back to the way they were prior. I think, I think now that consumers have sort of gotten a taste and, and maybe, maybe gotten used to, to a certain extent, the convenience of ordering online and just going direct, uh, as opposed to having to go out and get things. Like, I just, I don't see that reverting back to pre-COVID levels, you know? So for anybody, 
considering getting into e-commerce, like it's still a great time to do that. And it, and I think it will be for quite a while going forward. I, I think I, I just, I see e-commerce growing continually year over year. And I think COVID has probably just accelerated that process. And it's, and it's worse. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like one thing I was actually going to say is that like, you know, my, my own parents like have never ordered online. It's like everything, it's like retail, but you know, they're, they're older and like, they're like, hey, we're ordering online. And they're like, you know, borderline scared of computers when it comes to ordering, like they'll surf the internet and, you know, look at YouTubes and like all this other stuff, but like purchasing something, like giving their credit card number, it's like mm-hmm. never. And, you know, and like one day, like, you know, a few months ago, my mother was like, oh yeah, like I bought this thing online. I'm like, excuse me, like what happened? <laughs> like, and it's, you know, and, and I'm like, and you know, now, and she was like, yeah, like, you know, like I'll just do it for now. And, you know, when, when things go back to normal, like I'll just go back to like shopping in person. And now she's like, I don't want to leave the house. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, she's like, I'm going to continue doing this. So I think, you know, Tyson, you're like yeah. dead on, like, you know, will some people want to like get back out there and like shop in person? Yeah, probably. I mean, like not everybody's, you know, just going to like stay at home. But I, I do think that consumer behavior, like it's, it's not going to revert to, you know, mm-hmm. on the aggregate, it's not going to revert back to what it was before. And, 100%. you know, and, you know, like people, people now are, you know, getting used to shopping online and, you know, where I always think that retail is great is that, you know, you can discover new things that you didn't necessarily know, like walking through a grocery store. It's like, you always find products that are cool and like new and that you want to try, um, you know, or like clothes. If it, you want to try a brand new brand and you need to try it on, it's like, yeah, like you do that in store. But if you're reordering like you, you know, like some air force ones, because you, you know, you've owned a pair for the last five years, like you don't need to go to the store to make that mm-hmm. purchase right? hundred percent. So, yeah. I mean, you know, like, I think that that's kind of maybe where we're going with all of this, but yeah. So the other, the other thing I would say, just kind of on that note, like for people getting into e-commerce, I think a big, a big part of it, like people at retail, there's not a huge risk in trying something new, buying something, typically the return's very easy. And I think that's kind of the challenge with e-commerce is that it's a bit more of a a leap to make that first purchase, especially, you know, for example, with us, people that know the Drake Meats brand, we, we strategically incorporated that kind of into the Jerky in a Box brand so that they would be more likely to, to give it a try. And that's, that has definitely been the case, but we've, we've got a lot of new customers that had no clue who we are and still don't really know who we are. And so we, that was a really big part of what we've done so far and what we're going to try to continue to improve going forward is, is how do you reduce that risk of somebody purchasing, you know? So for us, what that looks like is we try to make it very clear that if, if you, you know, purchase a, a box of jerky and you're just not a fan of, of, you know, X, Y, and Z flavors, like we'll, we'll send you some replacements. We'll give you something that you like. Like we, we're, we're going to make sure that you, you get, you know, that number of good packs that you actually enjoy. That's kind of a part of our, of our, I guess, philosophy. And I would say that that's very important for other, for other e-commerce companies going into it as well. Um, well, that, really that just speaks to good risk. customer service, right? Like, so, yeah. you know, and like this goes to the difference between the business that you're running versus, you know, somebody that's opportunistically just trying to make a buy where it's yeah. like, oh, like you're not happy. I guess you're just not going to reorder, see a later buy. Mm-hmm. It's like to, to you, this is a game about like, well, how do I make a happy customer stay with us for the next five, 10 years, 20 years? 70 years right like yeah. it's like this is why the business has its longevity is uh, is because that's at the forefront of your decision making right it's like how do i do right by the yeah. customer yeah even if it's not your fault sometimes you just it's just the best decision to make keep the customer happy and that's kind of that's been the philosophy we're, we've tried to adopt yeah. any closing thoughts yeah, no, I uh, I don't have too much, but it's been it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to be on the podcast with you guys and uh, to work with you guys over the past few months has has been an absolute blast. So I'm I'm just very excited uh, to see what we can do in uh, in 2021. And for well, anybody listening, happen. please please contact these guys because <laughs> they can do some big things for you. So uh, I like that's it. My, when, that's my comment. 
I like it when the <laughs> shameless plug doesn't come from me and Ricky. That's always fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no way. Yeah. We'll cut it, Tyson. There.